vipers? <laughs> you, you brood of vipers? <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you, you, you brood of vipers? Yes, and Merry Christmas and joy of the world to you, too. <laughs> John the Baptist said these words, these brood of viper words. It was this same John who leapt in his mother's womb when Mary, carrying a baby herself, spoke to his mother Elizabeth. But in our story today, John is clearly not leaping for joy, is he? Rather, he is quite angry and a bit ticked for good reason. In John's day, as is the case in our own, John was surrounded by very religious folks who were not only arrogant and self-impressed, but had a nasty habit of putting everyone besides themselves down. And John was upset because these religious folks who thought they were perfect and in tune with God were actually about as far away from God as possible. And John was using strong language to try and encourage these religious people to turn from their religion back to God. John's irritation was certainly understandable as who really likes to hear incessant chatter from self-righteous egomaniacs? And if anything, John knew these religious folks were making it harder, not easier, for people to encounter God's life-changing love through their actions and attitudes. But at its core, our story today is not about John's irritation annoying perfectionistic religious folks, nor is it ultimately about God's wrath. Rather, the story is about God's wonderful, loving, inviting invitation to you and to me to have the chance to turn anything around at any moment. That with every breath we take, God offers us a brand new beginning, a new opportunity, a new way of being that will lead us closer to the love of God and being who we were meant to be. You know, as I think about us at the chapel, I, I don't think most of us are in church week to week because we think we have everything and every relationship down. I don't think we're here week to week because we think that everything in life is just dandy and wonderful and perfect. Rather, I believe most of us are here week to week because we know we really need God. And we want our lives to be more and more and more and more about the love of God. And most, if not all of us, pray and hope, at least with regard to someone or something in life, that there can be a turnaround or a new beginning or a new start. Well, with this in mind, today I'd like to spend some time speaking about a topic that I talk about and with some regularity and always in Advent, and that topic is repentance. Now, unfortunately, repentance gets a bad rap because it's often been hijacked by hyper-religious, perfectionistic folks that like to go around and scream at people to repent. The word repentance can have baggage for some people, but it is really too bad that this is the case because repentance can give us a new lease on life, the opportunity to turn something around and can move us closer to God. Repentance can actually help us to change from the inside out and discover joy and love and who we were meant to be. Well, today, as you know, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we enter the second week of Advent. And as I mentioned last week, Advent is the season we prepare to celebrate for the birth of Jesus, but also the time we're to think about the fact that Christ will come again and make everything right someday, perhaps even today. And having such a sense of anticipation is part of Advent and part of what it means to be a person of faith. And while anticipation for Christmas and Jesus' second coming is a key Advent theme, so is repentance. You might even say that anticipation gets us ready for Christ. Repentance gets us closer to Christ. And getting ready and getting closer to Jesus is what this time of year is all about. 
So as we explore repentance this morning, the first thing we need is a definition, a definition that many of you already know, but let's go over it, and that is that the English word repentance comes from Hebrew and Greek words that literally mean to turn, to turn around, to have a change of heart, to, to, to turn. It literally means to turn around, to change and turn into a different direction, to let go of a way of thinking or acting, to release a way of looking at something or someone, but ultimately, at its core, it means to turn back to God. Repentance means to change our purpose in life back to being about God. It means to work at getting our alignment, our lives back in alignment with God, and to leave behind those attitudes and values and actions that are not consistent with who God is. Repentance is all about fundamentally shedding stuff that gets in the way with our relationship with Jesus. Now, this theme of repentance or turning around or turning back to God is all over both the Old and the New Testament. And Jesus spoke about repentance over and over and over again. And so for a few moments this morning, let's explore some key things to keep in mind about repentance and what repentance involves. Well, if you read about Jesus' stories in the scriptures, Jesus made it crystal clear that everyone is in need of repentance because everybody has stuff or issues to deal with. Thank God. This in part is why John the Baptist was so furious at the religious folks because they were walking around acting as if they didn't have anything to deal with. They were just fine. But Jesus knew this was not the case and he understood that everybody strays from God. And he knew that when we stray from God, we end up feeling badly or guilty or we do things we would not normally do if we were feeling better about ourselves or in alignment with God. And Jesus made such points not to make people feel rotten, but rather to give people a pathway to a new beginning, a new start, a new opportunity, and for some people to discover love and forgiveness for the first time. That's why Jesus talked about turning back to God. You may remember the story in the Gospel of John that gets at what repentance is and is not about. You remember the story. It's about a woman that had been making really bad choices. She was having an affair. It was a very public deal, and folks in the village were really ticked off, and the religious people wanted to stone her to death because they said, that's what the Bible says. We need to stone her. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That is not okay. In fact, anyone among you who has not strayed from God, who has not sinned, you go ahead now and throw the first rock. And nobody picked up a rock because everybody knew that everybody had fallen astray. And Jesus' point then and on so many other occasions was that everyone turns from God. Everyone needs to turn back to God. Everyone needs to repent. But remember, repentance is not about being yelled at or screamed at or condemned or threatened. Rather, it is an invitation for a fresh start and a chance at a new beginning to turn around back to God. Here's what Paul writes about all of this in his letter to the people living in Rome. He says in one version of the Bible, some people are indeed on a dark spiral downward. But if you think that leaves you on the high ground where you can point your finger at another person, think again. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. After all, it takes one to know one. And he goes on to write, judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection of your own crimes and misdemeanors. God is not so easily diverted, Paul writes. He sees through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you've done. Paul's point, Jesus' point, repentance or turning back to God, turning back to the love of God, has nothing to do with judgment or pointing fingers, nor is it about being judgmental and harsh toward ourselves. Instead, as Paul wrote in one version of the Bible, repentance is all about dealing with ourselves and our own stuff and our own sin in a constructive, healthy, loving way that leads us closer to the love of God and new beginnings. 
So that's a very important thing to remember about repentance. It's not about being judgmental toward ourselves or others. Repentance is also not fundamentally about a response to getting caught or dealing with ultimatums. And while certainly we turn our lives around or we turn to God sometimes because we get caught in doing something or because other people have had it with us, ultimately repentance has to come from within us, from down deep within us, a desire to turn back to what we know is right, a desire to turn back to God, a desire to turn back to the love of God has to come from within, not from the outside or the other guy or the other gal. Which is why carrying around a sign with red letters telling people they're going to hell just doesn't work. <laughs> Repentance is an inside thing. It can never be forced from the outside. And we certainly don't have to wait to repent or to turn around until something bad happens. Having said all of this, I know and some of you know that turning back to God, turning our lives around in some way that makes that area of life more in alignment with God, turning around our relationship with somebody that brings it into alignment with God, with what God would have that relationship be about, is hard. It can be really hard because it takes letting go of our egos and getting over ourselves. Turning back to God and shedding stuff that gets in the way is tough. Ingrained ways of thinking and approaching things are not easy to turn from. And lots of people sometimes have a hard time repenting. And fortunately, the Bible is full of stories of people who struggle with repentance. And if you read the Old Testament, for example, you'll be amazed by this cycle that repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. It's just astonishing. And you know the cycle. A king comes to power, and at first the king is great. The king has integrity. The king is wonderful. The king makes good decisions. The king prays to God. But not after long, the king comes to power. Guess what? The king gets full of himself. He gets a tremendous ego. He loses sight of God. He ignores God, and bad things happen and everything crumbles. And despite this, another king comes to power. And at first things are great, but soon thereafter the king gets full of himself. He gets a big ego, he loses sight of God, he ignores things, and bad things happen. And this cycle repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. Because the kings cannot grasp what repentance means or turning back to God. Now, on one level, these stories are kind of amazing because you read them and king after king after king after king does the same thing. But as I think about these kings who engaged in the same sin and the same stuff over and over, I have to say that I'm glad there's stories in Scripture because there have been times in my life, frankly, in which I've not gotten it for a long period of time and have done the same stupid thing over and over and over and over again. There have been passages in which I have failed to look at myself in the mirror to get real with myself and to repent and to turn back to God. The times that I have fully embraced what Albert Einstein said, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result each time. I have to ask myself, am I insane sometimes? And I think these stories are in the Bible to let those of us who know or that sometimes have a hard time repenting and turning back to God in our lives or in some way that we're in good company, even royal company, as I mentioned, our reading today is from Matthew and John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, and John's calling in life was to prepare people for the arrival of Jesus, who would set everything right at a time when everything was wrong. He wanted people to prepare for it, to turn themselves back to God. And when John was dunking people in the Jordan River, it served as a ritual cleansing. It was a symbol of, being, of, of washing away from the person, all that was getting in their relationship with God. And John believed that people needed to be cleansed, to be washed, to repent, to get ready for the coming of God in person, Jesus. And yes, John absolutely preached that there would be consequences for those who did not repent and get their lives in alignment with God. And he did so with anger and vigor. But remember that anger and vigor was directed at those who thought they had no issues, who thought they were perfect, who thought they were the most religious, the most excellent. But he knew 
And every one of us here today knows the pain that comes from when we turn away from God in some areas of our life. We know the heartache that comes when we are acting or thinking or behaving in ways that are not in alignment with the love of God. It hurts. So as we think about John the Baptist being uh, dunking people in the river, I just want to talk briefly about what are some things to consider about how we repent now in our own day. And I'm not going to give you a prescribed formula of repentance, but I'd like to share some critical components of what I think repentance entails and involves. First, the hard part. Repentance or turning back to the love of God turning back to love has to start within and it begins with taking a close look at ourselves in the mirror it begins with an honest self-assessment it begins with looking at where we're angry and ticked and short-tempered and snippy and not kind and all of those things it begins with honest self-assessment it begins by asking ourselves How and what ways do I need to turn back to God? How have I strayed from God? How how and in what ways and areas of my life is my life not reflected of the love of God? How and in what ways of my life does it not invite people to come into the love and joy of God? And repentance hopefully compels us to ask questions. What's not in alignment in my life with God? What needs to change and why? What's getting in the way in my life? What really is my pain and hurt about, and how is it related to where I am with God? So repentance really, first and foremost, is all about looking in the mirror deeply and honestly. It's also important to remember that repentance is not a one-shot deal. It's not about something we do once and forget about it. I've repented, I'm in good shape now. Rather, repentance is a way of living. It's a way of being. It's a way of continually reminding ourselves that we need to turn back to God and the love of God. And again, this is not God's way of saying you are rotten or you're a brood of vipers. Rather, it's about God's continual invitation to you and to me to come back to God. It's certainly not about a guilt trip or beating ourselves up. Repentance also is also, however, about being brutally honest with God. It's about telling God what it is that we see about ourselves, the good, the bad, the ugly, the raw, the things we'd never think of sharing with another. It's about sharing with God how we wish we would change this or that. It's about telling God what we believe is honestly getting in the way of his love in our lives. The big word for this, of course, is confession which simply means being straight and getting real with God. Aside from confession, meaningful repentance includes sometimes rectifying the situation. It might mean stopping a behavior. It might include making amends with another. It might mean making something right that is wrong. It might include an apology as part of it. But repentance might mean the need to set something straight with somebody else or with ourselves. And while key ingredients of repentance include honest self-assessment, being straight with God, being straight with ourselves, asking God for forgiveness, making things right with others, understanding that repentance is a journey and not a one-shot deal, repentance at its core, as I've shared, is something, is about something I've shared throughout this sermon. At its core, repentance is a reminder to each one of us that we can always begin again. We can always begin anew. We can always start in a new direction in our relationship with God and with other people. John the Baptist, in his smelly, dirty, ugly clothes, as he was dunking people in the river, ultimately, he was trying to help people to turn back to God to turn their lives around and to focus on God and what God offers.
He wasn't putting people in the river so they'd feel condemned and useless. He was putting people in the river so they'd come to see themselves in exactly the opposite way. One last thing about repentance. Just one last brief thought. It's a great story, and maybe some of you know it. It's even better poetry. In the late 1800s in England, there was a fellow named Francis Thompson. I'd forgotten about Francis until recently and his poem, which I'm going to share in just a moment. Francis grew up wanting to be a priest and met a doctor. He actually went to medical school, whatever that meant in the 1800s, but he went to medical school. and He loved to write. He was a gifted writer. But one thing led to another, and he had some physical ailments. He fell on hard times, and he became actually addicted to opiates because of pain in his body. He took odd jobs, trying to keep things together, but eventually he broke down physically and mentally, and he ended up homeless on the streets of London. One story says he even tried to sell matches to make a living. But the one thing that he continued to do on the streets was to write, and he wrote a lot, and he wrote poetry. Well, eventually he befriended a prostitute, and they became close, and eventually she took him in and gave him lodging. And he continued to write and write. And after some time, a couple who happened to be publishers somehow came across him and his writings, and they read his poetry, and they were astonished. And they said, we're going to take you in for a while so you can continue writing. And eventually, his poems were published before he died, I think around the age 40, of tuberculosis. But one of his greatest poems is called The Hound of Heaven. Here are some excerpts in the middle of it in the traditional language. Francis wrote, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the lab labyrinth of my own mind and in the midst of my tears. And here Francis is talking about in his life that he tried to run away from God, tried to hide from God, wanted nothing to do with God. But here's some excerpts from the entire poem in, in a modern translation. I heard a story once, an incredible story. It told of one who is relentlessly faithful and loves us with unwavering love. It was said that he sorrows over broken people. It was said that he tirelessly pursues each last one, never stopping, never giving up, never stopping, and I fled. And soon I heard whispers, which soon became a sound, stronger, constant, unhurrying. And now I could tell what it was. It was the beat of footsteps. Footsteps down the street, footsteps on the sidewalk, footsteps outside the door, footsteps coming. And he was coming, and he was coming for me. And I fled. And then at the end of the poem, the character in the poem hears these words, I'm the one you have been seeking all your life. And then the poem goes on, and hearing those words, after the endless miles and fruitless searching, I finally quit running and reached out to the one who had sought me for so long. Well, this poem, it's, it's very powerful. And the main takeaway from it is that God is relentlessly pursuing you and me. That in fact, God is like a hound. Just picture a hound running after the scent. Well, God is like a hound running after the scent of you and me. God is like a hound who never stops, never gives up, never lets go. Even when we turn away and try to flee, we cannot get away from God. It's not possible. Francis came to understand this, and one day he quit running. In other words, 
Francis repented. And it was then that everything inside of him changed, not necessarily the circumstances on the outside of his life, but everything on the inside of Francis changed and was never the same because he encountered the love of God. So matter, no matter where you are today in your relationship with God, regardless of where I am at this moment, despite how we might de- be dealing with issues of repentance, let us take solace through it all that God pursues you and me like a hound, not to get us, but to love us in the way that only God can love. Thank God for the hound of heaven. And let us pray.